Indigenous Knowledge Interrupted, and our presenter will be Kyle Bobiwash. In addition to being a researcher in residence for the Office of Science of sorry, excuse me, Office of the Chief Science Advisor of Canada and a University of Manitoba professor. Kyle is the governance and education lead for the Cooperatives First. His work focuses on developing and delivering educational and developmental services for Cooperatives First. With degrees in geography and public policy, Kyle's educational background has focused on community development, governance, and organizational policy. Dr. Bobby Wash has helped is helping build better Indigenous science policy and capacity by including Indigenous knowledge. This inclusion, especially with consideration to agriculture policy, can encourage the preservation of ec ecological land integrity for the next seven generations. The basis of this talk will be on colonial policy and how it has interrupted and disrupted Indigenous knowledge and First Nations agriculture. Um, I am now going to pass it over to Kyle. Um, I will get you to share your screen for us and we'll begin whenever you're ready. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm always a, a little bit apprehensive um, when I'm asked to give a, a, a talk like this because, oh, yeah, you know, I still consider myself a, you know, a baby, a junior scientist still kind of learning the ropes uh, of science. Um, but something that I'm learning to appreciate a little bit more is, um, you know, just being out and about in both academia, uh, working with the public service, working out in community, having seen a lot of different communities, both across Canada and, and North America in, in general. And so an idea that always uh, comes back to me is, is this idea that um, Indigenous knowledge or, or traditional knowledge is something that's in the past that we need to recapture uh, so, and, and that's something that we, that, you know, all, all the problem, all the solutions to the world's problems are stuck in uh, some this historical knowledge. Uh, but something that I would, I mean, the major goal of my talk today is really to think about how we can uh, go forward and actually start to reinvigorate the process of the creation of new, uh, not only Indigenous knowledge, but a, you know, a, a greater understanding of science and the methodology methodology associated with it uh, to make it more inclusive and actually more uh, effective going forward. Um, but I'm originally from uh, North Shore of Lake Huron. Uh, my, I'm in Anishinaabe from Mississauga First Nation. Uh, the town I grew up in, Blind River, right down the road, is a, a town known for um, lumberjacks and uh, putse, and, uh, but beautiful vistas and these views of the, of the Great Lake, living right on the lake. Yeah, so, so I mean, and then talk, thinking of um, where I come from, you know, it is the town of Lumberjacks, and a lot of my family are these uh, people that worked in the forestry industry, trappers that were gone from home for, uh, you know, seasons at a time while, while they uh, went trapping, uh, and medicine people who traveled all over, not only our particular region, but went out to other, other regions to learn their, um, you know, those protocols and some of that, you know, gain some of that knowledge to bring it back to my home community. And again, you know, this is the moment that I like to talk about my own positionality and, and my own privilege, um, because I think it's important that we understand where our knowledge comes from and where our interest and, and where our capacity actually comes from. I was fortunate to uh, have a family that could afford uh, canoes, kayaks, and uh, have parents that can, uh, uh, you know, that had the opportunity to take me out on the land, uh, you know, despite, you know, me personally feeling like I was being slaved by carrying all these all this fishing and hunting equipment and portaging, um, you know, I, I, you learn to appreciate that now that not everybody has those opportunities. And again, thinking of my, of my privilegedness, um, you know, I had an opportunity to have all sorts of jobs within the community and parents that can support some, some of my hobbies. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people don't have that opportunity to really, you know, get those identification books, those natural history books at a young age. Uh, I had a very supportive mother that allowed me to have all sorts of really interesting uh, yeah, reptiles and amphibians, right? I had Madagascar day geckos and exotic fish. Um, my parents were really uh, supportive and had the, the capacity to actually support my hobbies. And, and a lot of this went into me always believing that, you know, I was a scientist or that I could be a scientist just as much as anybody else. And, and why I think it's important to, for us to talk about where we come from and who we are and how we got here is because everybody has these uh, a unique, uh, I, I don't know, historical uh, connections to wherever they're from. Um, whether you know your genealogy or not, and whether it's conscious or not, where you come from, who you are, 
is uh, affects how you think about whatever is out there in the landscape. So if you know we think, oh, I, I'm indigenous uh, or I'm European, right? Where you're going to have these philosophers that you think, oh, this was the the start of the uh, enlightenment of man and science. And I think it's important to to recognize that a lot of our history affects how we think about things and how and that might actually leak over into um, some subconscious biases and things like that. And if we think about Indigenous peoples in particular, right, we have all these communities, there's nice maps on the Government of Canada website of where particular communities are located. But again, this is just a small sliver of where Indigenous peoples are from and who they are. If we took a, if we take a small look of what the Anishinaabe land looked like uh, pre, you know, around the 1800 period, we see that there's this vast area of either uh, Ojibwe's, or Ojibwe's, Mississaugis, uh, Potawatomi's, uh, Chippewa Soto, depending on where, where you're from, and these Algonquins. And it's important to recognize that, yes, this was the traditional territory. These were uh, the areas, the interfaces where uh, indigenous groups were interacting either with other indigenous groups or with the settlers of those times. And if we think about where these communities are located now, right, it's a small sliver uh, of uh, what this area represents. And we know the, the these stories and these ideas of where we come from affect how we view where others may come from. For a long period of time, we believed a relatively simple story of the peopling of the uh, North America or of the Americas in general with this Clovis first hypothesis, uh, really thinking that, oh, these indigenous people just you know, managed to find a break in the uh, ice sheet and, and they just moved there all in mass, right? This was the story. Uh, I mean, it's probably still in a lot of books that are not updated, but, but, but the story is a lot more complex than that. We know that now there's probably quite a few uh, distinct migrations that happened into the Americas. And you know they were not just kind of doing this randomly or following kind of the juiciest, uh, most tasty animals that would support their community. But they were also bringing plants and utilizing resources and actually modifying those landscapes in which they started to migrate through. And again, just to kind of add that complexity to the story, if we start looking at, you know, just the, uh, I guess, the history and kind of the genetic history of the peoples of, of the Americas, we see that, you know, there's all sorts of uh, dates or, or there's a, the origin of a lot of that current, uh, di yeah, the origin of the uh, genetics of, of those particular people come from all different times. Right? We can see areas down in South America that, uh, you know, that type, that genotype was there 9,600 years before present, uh, with some uh, might have, uh, like Laramate, that might have that, that the gen genetic origin of those people are only there 900 years before present. This doesn't tell you necessarily that, oh, these people only got here, you know, 900 years ago, but it tells you about that rich history of exchange, not only of knowledge, but of people, of genetic materials, of, you know, that, that migration, the movement of people, the interactions between people across all these, all, all the Americas, right? It wasn't just, oh, these tribes settled down, you know, 10,000 years ago and they evolved. There was this large change uh, that can, that, you know, happened historically um, and, I guess what I'm trying to say today is that we've kind of stopped uh, the, this change and this exchange of information and knowledge, um, and we'll get into that later. And again, this kind of highlights what we think, you know, say the United States of America looks like. We can uh, organize it through cultural areas focused on different uh, indigenous languages and cultures. But something that I think is worth appreciating is that uh, the linguistic diversity in the Americas is something of a uh, mystery or an outlier. In terms of what we know uh, geologically or anthro anthropo anthropologically about the peopling of the Americas, it would seem that the evolution of the diversity of languages would suggest a date of arrival to the Americas a lot earlier than what the geological or anthropological evidence would suggest. Uh, Joanna Nichols has a, a really interesting paper about this using 
um, spread rates of language and, and really trying to backdate what that actually means for the uh, evolution or the initial peopling of the Americas. Um, it's worth a read. And again, I, and I think you know, a lot of this stuff is unknowable, um, but again, it gives us different perspectives of a, a scientific fact or a scientific um, theory that we've had uh, for a long time that you know, might not necessarily uh, agree with what Indigenous peoples think uh, their peopling or, or, or their evolution on, on the land actually looks like. And again, you know, I'm, I'm a biodiversity scientist, you know, I, I study bees, I like plants, you know, and I have all these random pets, you, you might hear my pet parrot in the back yelling away. Um, and it's important to, for me to uh, express that people are part of biodiversity. People are uh, driving biodiversity. We think of these uh, builders of habitat like beavers and uh, you know, beavers are, are big mammals that, that keep prairie uh, areas open, um, but people are just as important. If we take a look at ethno-linguistic groups, which is kind of a, a, just a way to uh, distinctualize, I guess, uh, different uh, Indigenous communities, we can see that there's some distinct areas where there's a lot of these ethno-linguistic groups or there's a lot of ethno-linguistic diversity within very close regions. And for the most part, most of these regions uh, correlate really nicely with these centers of domestication. So this map by Larson gives us all the, uh, not all of them, but most of the likely centers where domestication of at least one plant or animal took place. So if we go back and forth and we can kind of uh, line these up and see that, yes, you know, humans uh, were peopling a lot of these areas. There's a lot of diversity of people that probably evolved from these areas due to either the biodiversity, that nascent biodiversity that was there or the ability of those people to actually work with this biodiversity to produce something new that actually uh, really made sure that that mutualism or that interaction between plant, animal, and, and human was there to allow those people to actually succeed. And this is where I, I think it's important to think about what creation stories mean. Um, you know, I, I hear a, a lot of perspectives or maybe a lot of mistaken interpretations of a creation story being, you know, our, our version of, uh, of the Bible or the Old Testament, um, you know, it's, it's these cultural or religious uh, beliefs. And, and yes, I agree, there, there, there's a lot of uh, that supernatural component to a lot of these uh, stories. But I think what is um, often missing and not really appreciated is the diversity of these stories and how that diversity of these creation stories actually gives you that context for who these people are. So when we're thinking of uh, people associating creation stories with turtles and Turtle Island, right? This is a very North American uh, site to see a turtle and, and we know these uh, rich ecosystems and marshlands are really important uh, for diversity and for, and for resource gathering. If we think about more um, arid areas where they have creation stories associated with particular birds that um, actually find those areas of diversity or corn, a plant that's uh, evolved alongside the evolution of a lot of these cultures. We see that the, you know, those are just hints of that richness that the creation story can give us to identifying who people are. And, and again, this is kind of just uh, two of my favorite paintings, one by uh, Jim Oskar Nagish on the left and then uh, one of Norval's works on the right. And again, it gives us two different potential perspectives of who humans are, or who humans are, what, what the ecology of a system might be, right? On the left, we might have an example of everything's uh, focused on that plant, on that primary productivity, if you will, of nature of the environment and how that primary productivity and the integrity of which uh, supports all those beings around it. Versus if we kind of think about Morso's work here, we can kind of interpret as humans being at the center of biodiversity. We know we are this huge force of nature that has the ability to not only modify landscapes, but manage, uh, but modify uh, kind of global uh, ecological functions and global trends like climate change. And, and why I present this well, why I'm talking about this prior to even getting into any sciences, just to think about what are those uh, philosophical leanings that we might not necessarily think that we have and how might those actually influence how we think? Because if we think about what the uh, foundations of science in Canada look like, you know, we think, oh, who were the first scientists in Canada? 
you know, if you ask me, of course, I'm going to say indigenous people, but if you ask people not kind of versed in that history, we'll think, oh, you know, it's probably those first explorers that were here collecting plants, uh, that were here kind of writing descriptions of the landscape. Uh, we, people like Jean Cabot, Jean Cabot uh, Jacques Cartier, Samuel de Champlain, all, all these people were hunting for this rich diversity uh, or the rich productivity of the Americas and were so amazed at some of the uh, uh, some of the things that they saw and the richness of the land. So we have Cartier's hunt for agriculture, where he was, you know, amazed by amazed by the stuff that he saw uh, and compared it to what they had in Europe at the time, as well as uh, Champlain's lustier land, where he was so amazed by the variety of trees um, that he was really um, intrigued by uh, the lack of cultivation that, or in his mind, the lack of cultivation that uh, resulted in this diversity. And because I went to Miguel, I'm always fascinated by uh, Jacques Cartier's uh, descriptions of when he came along the Hochelaga and saw all sorts of indigenous people uh, along the Fleuve Saint Laurent that were, you know, he saw these, you know, wild and savage folk who covered themselves with certain tan colors, right? He, he was so uh, amazed by not only the cultural richness of the people, but all that corn that they saw that extended from the Fleuve all the way up uh, to the to the little hill that uh, Miguel sits on to this day. And something we don't often think about, and I, I really haven't thought about much either, because, uh, you know, we think generally of the Colombian exchange, where, uh, you know, Christopher Columbus, he was, you know, he arrived more southerly in the North America, or in the Americas, and, you know, that started the exchange of a lot of crops like corn, like tomatoes, like tobacco, like chocolate, uh, that resulted in, in a greater, uh, you know, a greater food and a greater agricultural richness in Europe. But there's also this uh, Cartierian or Champlainian exchange that we often don't think about. So by the time Jacques Cartier and Samuel de Champlain got here, you know, everybody knew about corn already. It was already being used within those, you know, first hundred years of uh, discovery of the Americas by uh, European settlers. And, you know, at that time, there's already dozens of different types of squashes already out there. But what Cartier and Champlain wanted to look at was to enhance that pharmacopoeia, advance that medicinal plant knowledge here in the Americas. So, you know, that's what a lot of their work focused on if we're, if we're thinking of that natural history interest that they had here. And, you know, being a, a big uh, reader of, of food, food articles in, in the New York Times and, and for food blogs and things like that, um, you know, I'm always intrigued by foodies and that foodie culture. And Champlain was one of these new world foodies, right? He, he one of his description of sunchokes, the Jerusalem artichoke was the first description of that, you know, really delicious uh, plant. Um, yeah, and I guess he was just so amazed uh, by all these fascinating things that, you know, whether it was the animal products or plant products that he, you know, he provided these to the king, you know, showing his love of this rich diversity. And even if we look at some of his maps, this is a, a small map of, uh, I guess, the eastern portion of Nouvelle-France or the northeastern part of Nouvelle-France at the time. We can see even within his mapping of the territories, he has all these cool little natural history drawings and descriptions of the plant. And, you know, sometimes it's identified as something new or they, uh, you know, or it harkens back to an example uh, that they might have in the Europe, uh, in Europe of something similar. And he, in it, if we take a look closely, we can see evening primrose, wild ginger, uh, we can see uh, wild grapes, fox grapes, uh, creeping snowberry, uh, white dead nettle, um, or actually the white dead nettle and poison ivy are a misidentification in this. Uh, but, but, but we see that he was really attentive to uh, better understanding the land. So it makes sense that, yes, you know, these were some people doing science in that typical way. They were writing things down. They were, they're drawing these things out there. They're writing descriptions of the use. And, you know, this, this did exist, but eventually we lost a little bit of that richness, right? The corn, potatoes, uh, squashes, they're fairly easy to grow. So that ease of production allowed a lot of these products that were uh, that, that were products that were a product of long time cultivation by indigenous peoples to become very common and super productive. And, and I think as, as we all know, as these things come become more utilized, 
we don't necessarily take that their beauty or we don't necessarily appreciate them. The fact that uh, the dishes, including vegetables, increased in, in recipe books at the time by 400% and that there's double the amount of species mentioned is due to that innovation and that interaction and that mutualism between plants or animals uh, and the indigenous peoples of the America. And ultimately that resulted in the origins of a lot of these species to become misconstrued. People thought uh, corn was from Turkey and sunflowers were from Brazil, right? There, there's a lot of uh, mis- yeah, I, I guess just not having the knowledge of where the, the, the origins of these plants were, or were what they were, <laughs> sorry. So again, thinking about what, you know, what does that evolution of science in Canada look like? You know, it could be based on uh, Collège du Québec, Université de Laval, who had a small little science department in the early 1600s, and then those G13 universities really building up uh, science. And of course, we have all our scientific societies, uh, especially the one I belong to, Entomological Society of Canada, being really early uh, emergers in, in these people trying to codify and formalize the practice of science. And, you know, there's a lot of fantastic, uh, I don't know, a Marquis, a politician in 1882, but, but these prominent people in society that uh, really uh, saw all these, you know, really well off gentlemanly type people dressed fancily uh, engaged in natural history. So they wanted to codify it a little bit. And, and, you know, the development of the Royal Society of Canada comes from that, that gives us a little bit, bit of that formalization that we still have to this day. And, you know, it, this is expanded and being in agriculture, I'm specifically fascinated by uh, forestry and agricultural, uh, the, for, the forestry or the evolution of forestry and agricultural fields um, with a lot of these uh, services being, uh, you know, uh, be, being invented and being developed fairly early on in the development of Canada. And we know the experimental farms program across Canada has been ongoing for quite a long time, really looking at, you know, improving our capacity to uh, develop new agricultural methods, new cultivars to feed not only Canada, but nowadays to really feed the world. And, you know, that's the early 1900s, but science continued to expand. And, and I don't know if people recognize these places as uh, scientific uh, institutes, and I, I don't have my, um, I don't quite have the Q&As up, but if uh, anybody, I, I don't, yeah, if anybody has an idea of what these scientific institutes are, I mean, I'll pause for a second just to see if anybody puts anything in the chat box. Does anybody recognize any of these buildings? Right, sure, perfect. Yes, yes, there, there's these residential schools, right? And you know, I, I'm characterizing these as uh, scientific institutes. And, and we don't necessarily think of a residential school as a scientific institute. It, it certainly did not provide science education to any of these youth. But something that we tend to forget is that, you know, the children, the students, the participants in these areas actually were the uh, study animals or the study organisms, I mean, uh, they're viewed as study organisms by researchers, right? We think of the first nutritional experiments that took place in 1942 on, uh, I guess this was with the Norway House Cree, right? Where 125 students were selected to receive vitamin supplements, but then all the other students did not receive these vitamin supplements. Um, right, and a lot of these schools are, are located, uh, some are like say, uh, Cecilia Jeffrey, uh, or St. Mary's and Kenora, you know, these, these schools are, are, are still with us today, right? We can see these locations. And, you know, it's a, a sad fact. Yes, the can Canadian development, uh, you know, can Canada led the development of early nutrition, but this was at the cost to those Indigenous participants within this pro project. Uh, Dr. Percy Moore and Frederick Tisdall, these were uh, people that had actually invented and developed Pablum, right? A really important uh, juvenile or neonatal juvenile uh, nutritional product. But the, the you know, the success of this, um, you know, the success of this product, uh, you know, gave these researchers that capacity to actually start to study the state of nutrition of the, Indi uh, the Indigenous people there. Um, again, leading to the studies on Indigenous participants. Right, and these are just a few quotes that I like to think about, uh, why I would like everybody to think about and keep in mind that the goal of this research, again, benefited, you know, generally most Canadians, but it was at the cost of uh, 
um, creating these control groups that you know were already malnourished because of colonialism and just just increased the gap not only amongst the indigenous non-indigenous peoples but even uh, between indigenous peoples themselves within these schools. And I, and I don't want to belabor the point, but I think it's important that we think about, you know, yes, the, the, there was some interest, somewhat interesting research occurring in parallel with a lot of this where, you know, people just wanted to know what in Indigenous peoples were using, uh, what, what their nutritional status was, what was their relationship uh, to, to different food items in their traditional territories. And again, again without the uh, negative context of, uh, you know, this really horrible practice, you know, th this is what we're, we're hoping to do nowadays is really start to increase the sustainability of local food knowledge. Um, but, but that work started from a negative place. And, and people who've heard my talk before um, know that I like to think about agriculture as both a, a weapon for good and a weapon of bad. And just to kind of go along the point of uh, agriculture as a weapon of, of negativity, we, we know residential schools uh, industrial schools in the United States started out as this uh, institute or, or these labor camps essentially that forced uh, children to work the land uh, under the context of learning a little bit of agriculture. We know agriculture uh, was the driver for the displacement of you know some of the larger displacements across the Americas of indigenous people. Here we have the Trail of Tears uh, where Eastern woodland Indians, including the Cherokee, Cree, uh, the Chickasaw, the Choctaw, the Seminole, were all moved from their traditional territory over to Oklahoma territory to make way for these farmers that saw that huge richness and productivity uh, of the land. And Nicholas Flood Davin, uh, Davin a, um, you know, a writer, a former MP for Assiniboia West, he went down to study these residential schools in the US and brought this idea uh, of the industrial school to Canada which we eventually you know, formed into all these residential schools. Here's the Brandon Industrial Institute, uh, where, you know, again, there's some schooling, I imagine, but the vast majority of the work was uh, work out on the land, a lot of labor to maintain a lot of these agricultural, um, agricultural projects or agricultural uh, productivity that was taking place on the land. So much so that even certain school inspectors or the one school inspector that was actually allowed at the Red Deer Industrial or um, Indigenous Residential School saw that the farming operations were so extensive that he noticed that the students were spending half their time laboring uh, rather than actually learning. So, so this idea, oh, and I, and I hope that this idea is gone, that these re residential schools were there for education has gone. Um, but again, this is just evidence of kind of the, uh, the, the, the torturous history of these, area, of these schools. And something, one of the earliest um, kind of more expansive ideas about uh, where, where our knowledge comes from and what it actually might mean to the practice of science, I, I like to think back to Robert McGee, who was a, uh, you know, he's, I think he's the former curator of the Canadian Museum of Civilization, and he's, you know, he's this really interesting archaeologist that had this idea that, you know, he, we talk about the origin of humans, the, the uh, origin of humans to the Americas and the origin of humans in general. And what he saw was that the, there was a huge difference in opinion and that a huge difference in the way we talk about uh, where humans come from uh, amongst non-Indigenous people and Indigenous people. So, so he read this really interesting idea about who owns prehistory uh, about the Bering Land Bridge dilemma that I think it applies to a lot of science fields. It's not only who owns prehistory, and I like to kind of contextualize it as who actually owns science and who's, uh, who, who, who gets to decide what's right in terms of our knowledge creation uh, in, in our society. So these are some questions I'm hoping to uh, come back a little bit later on, but I think it's important that we think about them now. Uh, and so just to kind of prime everybody's pump to uh, get you thinking about these things and potentially provide a little bit of comment after my talk. Um, again, and what I'd like to think about, you know, Bruce Smith labels it the cultural context of plant domestication in Eastern North America. And the idea that I'm trying to uh, get across today is that I don't necessarily think it's only a cultural context, right? I, I, there's these, uh, a lot of talk about two-eyed seeing um, and again, I, I 
unfortunately, I haven't had the opportunity to live in an, envi in an environment of 2 seeing because I've been so privileged of having both Indigenous knowledge and the access to all sorts of Western scientific knowledge, if you will. So I never was able to, and I still have a difficulty um, seeing them separate, but I, I think the goal of my talk today is to think about how we can better uh, align these things to uh, provide benefits to uh, both, you know, people in community and, and people in academia and how our needs for this um, knowledge translation between us is, is really important for the uh, proper, equitable, and effective development of future science. And of course, and I, I like to talk about these things through agriculture and, and through food because, you know, that's always on my mind. If we think of Fasciolus acutifolius, we know that it's been harvested for thousands of years by different tribal groups in the southern U.S. And um, you know, even the settlers at the time saw how interesting and how valuable it was through its drought resistance. Um, and many times we can see it through old USDA or, or, or old agricultural gray literature where, um, you know, kind of those extension agents were uh, really concerned about its disappearance uh, multiple times over the past hundred years even. And this is just kind of, I like to show where things are from. This is a, a graph from a publication from Gary Paul Nabin, and he shows kind of the, the wild distribution of, of this plant. And I think it's really important to think about where our things, where our products come from, right? We think we have all, all this fantastic agriculture in Manitoba. Well, a lot of the varieties have got here, uh, a lot of these varieties that were that are in production right now were used by the indigenous groups, but you know it only got here after you know hundreds of years of exchange and relationship building between different tribes and different groups and, and different um, yeah, different groups bringing these things and sharing their knowledge across the Americas. And why I think you know I like talking about beans in particular is the fact that you know beans tell us a lot more than just um, you know, this is a good product for growing, right? It tells us about those, uh, it tells us about those forces, those selection factors that a lot of these groups, a lot of these different indigenous groups and peoples were facing at the time that resulted in different varieties, right? So we might have a, a variety that's adapted to uh, the floodplains, right? Which used to be a fairly common occurrence in the Southwest and North America um, versus those that are adapted to uh, group are adapted to areas that are a little bit more dry and um, a little bit more sloping. So you can already see that if we're thinking of some of the Pueblo people, they have both of these territories and there's family groups spread across this territory. So of course that there's this, this, this evolution, they had to uh, adapt with this. And not only did the people adapt, but they made sure that they were able to utilize plants that also adapted. And of course we, we can characterize it um, not only ecologically, but we can look at it morphologically and we see, oh, there's all sorts of seed types and land races. And, you know, these things are not random occurrences. Uh, yes, we can classify them uh, scientifically, but we don't often take time to actually classify them uh, and what, the, what that actually meant to those people. Um, I'll skip this. Uh, but if we think about that, the culture of the temporary bean, we know that there's actually groups of people that were known as the temporary eaters, right? The Papago people are known as the people that, you know, really relied heavily on this. And if we go and we look at, and we ask their elders and we ask their knowledge holders, well, what do these beans actually mean? Well, a lot of times based on these varieties, they tell you not only about the, you know, the growing conditions and those uh, environmental stresses faced by people, but they also tell a story of that cosmology uh, of the uh, stories associated of human and land and the universe. So, you know, it's more than just something that's growing in the ground. It really connects them to who they are as people and who they are in this place in the universe. Um, and, I, and I say I'm at 136. And, and of course, corn tells us a similar story of adaptation of people. We know that there's a really complex history of corn, uh, of the genetics of corn and these land races that coincide really nicely, actually, with the evolution and the diversity and the movements of people and uh, the, the overall changes in genotypes of people across North America, or the Americas in general. But we also know that corn diversity is being lost. And it's somewhat sad because if we look at things like um, Zuni fetishes over uh, with the Zuni people, or we look at Navajo rugs and how um, corn maidens and the tree of life in the Navajo nation is centered around corn, that the loss of this diversity 
means more than just the loss of alleles that might allow us to adapt to uh, new future environmental conditions that might be, uh, you know, that, that might not be good for our current corn varieties. It's a, it's a, you know, we're losing the stories of the uh, Navajo people and how they associate corn with the biodiversity that surrounds them and supports them. And again, it, it, we lose that story of what were those people facing in terms of the agricultural constraints that they had in those areas. And if we look at it, you know, more and more Western scientifically, I guess, yes, we, we can see some, there's been a, a whole lot of studies showing that, you know, there's been slight increases over the past 20 years of uh, the diversity or the number of varieties per farm. But if we look at these studies a little bit more closely, like uh, George Dyer did, what he sees is that there are, if, if you do the study properly, really going to community, really going to the people that are, um, maintaining varieties or maintaining a, a more uh, traditional uh, farm system in Mexico, that there's actually a, a quite a huge loss in the diversity of, of these, uh, of the cultivars or of the varieties of corn being used. And if we look at, you know, at an even smaller level, when we're looking at family groups uh, and small little places within distinct municipalities, we see the abandonment of land races over, you know, over the last 50 years in Mexico, a again, you know, losing, losing that richness of not only those alleles and the genetic possibilities of, you know, some of these really cool adaptations that these uh, cultivars might have. But again, we're losing those stories of not of those families. We're losing the stories of these people. We're losing stories of something we're about to celebrate um, again uh, next, next week, I think, in, in terms of the American Thanksgiving, where, you know, the, these harvest ceremonies, uh, the Green Corn Festival for, uh, used by the people in the eastern part of North America was again a part uh, a celebration of not only the diversity and the productivity of the crop, but of the people and their culture and their history in general. And again, we can see this across all sorts of nations. If we think about the Haudenosaunee, they have this string bean ceremony. Again, these, these are uh, harvestings, uh, the, the first harvesting and then offering that first harvest of string bean uh, to the creator and to all those that came before us because it's upon them which allowed a lot of our communities to continue surviving. So this is getting back to me um, thinking about why we need better science. Again, from a biodiversity uh, perspective, it's really easy to answer. If we look at uh, all the diversity just in commercial seed houses, not even thinking about indigenous groups, uh, but the diversity of plant or cultivars available in uh, commercial seed houses compared to those uh, 80 years later in 1983, we see a huge decrease in just that richness uh, of uh, cultivars available to us. Again, which is sad um, from a biodiversity perspective, from a, a foodie perspective, but from a a human perspective, because because the richness of a lot of these species are in, are the richness of a lot of these people are embedded in these species. So again, if I if I pull up a, a slide for what, what's Canada's science vision, the idea is to make science more collaborative, right? Uh, a, of course, we want to have evidence based decision making, but I think it's really important to promote equity and diversity in research. And I don't mean this just by having you know more brown people, more black people, more, more people of diverse backgrounds in, in in science, but actually to really expand uh, the way we look at science. And an example I like to use is wild horses, right? I mean, I think if, we're, if we know anything about biodiversity and horses and horse history, we, we like to think that uh, horses are non-native species. And you know, they can be pests on, on the environment or they're pests to a lot of people on rangelands, but are horses native species? Right. If we look at government agencies in both the U.S. and Canada, they will not consider a horse a native species. But we know that um, all horses, despite having gone extinct in the Americas 11,000 years ago, all horses actually derive from North America. Right. They they came from North America. They migrated themselves over uh, to the other continent, and you know they developed and evolved over there. And we think of the vast majority of wild horses actually. Um, the vast majority of wild horses uh, that we have right now are uh, from European stock for the most part. But again, who gets to make this decision of um, uh, what is a non-native species? Is there such thing as an American Indian horse? If you ask a lot of indigenous people, um, I mean, if you look, ask non-indigenous people, right, there, there is always this question of whether they're these feral invasive pests but to a lot of groups, whether we're in Northern uh, Alberta, Northern British Columbia, or even here in Manitoba, uh, 
we know that these ponies and these horse varieties are tell a story of a people. They're really into, they're integral to the development of a lot of these societies. We know early indigenous horse culture actually transformed a lot of these cultures when they were able to get a lot of these uh, early Spanish horses. And soon, I, with no time at all, within the 1800s, we had horses throughout the West in North America going up to as far as Oregon and Washington, uh, you know, horses were in use. And some of the most beautiful and some of the most important artifacts that we do still have from a lot of those early days uh, revolve around that horse culture. And you'll talk to, to people from communities that have a horse culture. Horses are their corn. Horses would be at the center of their universe, essentially. So I think why we need better science and why we need to start expanding our idea of what science is and how we go about doing it is to make sure that we take in this a little bit more nuanced view of what science is. If we look at how we treat all these feral and wild horses, they're by nobody's ethos, um, indigenous or non-indigenous, do I think our management of them actually uh, actually can be considered respectable. And not only that, but you know, thinking about their utilization on the landscape, you know, despite them being wild and potentially non-native, they're just as important to the ecosystem as a cow might be for productivity. And they're probably even more important and potentially even uh, are these big uh, landscape modifiers like uh, the bison used to be. So again, I'd like people to think about if they're working on particular species, crops or commodities or within ecosystems, what beyond the, you know, that biological, physiological entity, what else might that mean, right? If we think about honey, right? We, we know the early, uh, indigenous peoples that saw honeybees were somewhat scared of honeybees. They thought the honeybees as the white man's fly because the arrival of the white man's fly, this honeybee, uh, you know, came before colonization, came before the removal of those indigenous peoples from their land. So when we think of honey, we don't necessarily think about that history that it might have with indigenous peoples. And again, you know, we, 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 we have a, oh, I say I'm running out of time, but, but I'll kind of wrap this up quickly. Um, we, we know that indigenous peoples are these historical land users and they've been you know, manipulating and modifying landscapes. And when uh, the European settlers got here, they saw this beautiful, pristine, biodiverse region. But this biodiversity was a product of these indigenous peoples. If we look at some of Fickford Burke's early work, he documents all sorts of fire management use in the Americas um, that really resulted in some really interesting ecosystems. And if we, if we think about how, when we overlay fire onto the Americas, we see that there's these huge dark areas that are these ecosystems that actually don't exist anymore. If we think of the kind of the Midwest American oak savanna, this was a hugely rich, unique environment. Oak savannas generally are not um, very common anymore at all uh, across uh, Canada, especially. Um, but we see one of the hugest, one of the largest oak savannas, um, right, has basically turned into the uh, honey pot for agricultural uh, agriculture in the Americas right now. And I think it's important to think about these cultural, what we, what we might consider cultural practices or tradition or indigenous knowledge are actually these ecological mitigation techniques. It allows us to work with the environment a little bit better. It allows us to uh, benefit from ecological functions uh, that might be sparse in nature to really maximize their benefit uh, for ourselves while maintaining some degree of sustainability. And again, just to think why we need better science. I mean, ask a, you know, ask a taxonomist. I, I see a few of my colleagues in, in the room uh, that are focused on the taxonomy, that local knowledge of the diversity is really important, but understanding how that landscape and the resource management systems affect that diversity is really important. But that's only important to a certain extent. There's, I mean, our science is no good if it's actually not incorporated into that public knowledge or into our public policy. And only when we start to really bring all these aspects of science together from that, you know, development of uh, whatever our natural history is into, into a more codified system or science and really bring that into our uh, political system, can we start to think about changing the way we view nature and who we are as uh, people and what our responsibilities are to the environment. And again, I like to think about, you know, the environment being mutualisms upon mutualisms upon mutualisms. I just wanted to highlight a Lopez Uribe paper uh, that talked about how indigenous peoples brought these squashes uh, throughout the North America, resulting in the expansion of the range of all these beautiful squash bees. So I think I will stop there and open it up for questions. 
um, thinking about why we need better science, but it is to manage all these problems that we're seeing right now, whether it's the management of predators or it's the management of our fisheries and what is the proper way to actually look at these things and in incorporate a lot of this land-based experience that communities have had uh, uh, with a lot of these resources. Right, I think there's all sorts of new ways to look at it. We don't need to look at it only from a neoliberal economic sense. Uh, even if we think about who we are as scientists, I don't think that often agrees with our, um, our, our processes or the way we think. So thinking about how we can uh, make these more uh, equitable to everybody involved in this resource extraction or this resource use is important. And of course, we, we know, you know, scientists often discover things that Indigenous people have known for centuries. I've, I've gone through a lot of my undergrad in ecology, thinking about, oh my God, I've, my grandma or my dad has told me this long ago, let's move this lecture along. Um, and we know that the richness of all our knowledge as a human uh, is actually, uh, actually improves when we start to bring in different perspectives. So I think it's important that we think about how we can diversify um, and bring in new perspectives to make science better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyle. I'll get you to unshare your screen. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, so one of the questions was, how does the cultivation of animal products compare to plant products? Um, yeah, well, well, that's that's an interesting topic. Uh, of course, we, we, I mean, I don't want to say blessed, but you know, Europe was blessed with. I don't want to say dumber animals, but animals more more prone and more liable to domestication, resulting in the evolution of that particular type of agriculture in um, in Europe versus in North America. A different, uh, you know, a different approach really had to be taken. Of course, there's game farms, but we know a lot of these animals are not easily domesticatable. So it was the large scale transformations of the habitats through burning, right? Increasing that undergrowth in the under, or increasing that plant growth in the understory of forest that provided all sorts of beautiful pasture land or the maintenance of pasture land through burning that allowed all that diversity to, to uh, that, that animal diversity to actually be there able to be hunted, right? So it's just two different approaches that um, had to evolve based on what that, you know, biodiversity was in those particular regions. Right. Um, and one of our questions from Charlie was, uh, the University of Manitoba being on Treaty 1 territory with Dakota, Anishinaabe, Cree, Inuit, and Diné, um, what are the key agricultural stories and plants we should be learning and teaching in order to play off of the Indigenous, or incorporate more of the Indigenous knowledge? Right, I mean, and, it's, and I really didn't get into any of these details, but there's a lot of plants that are actually not used anymore agriculturally that were really important. We have a lot of small seed varieties, um, but e even the story of how something like corn got here, you know, hundreds of years ago, something how beans and squash varieties got here hundreds of years ago is important. And I think it's not necessarily about teaching those particular varieties. Um, and holding up as, you know, oh, this is a variety that my people invented, or, you know, tomatoes are an indi indigenous product. Um, but, it, but it is really about the story of how these things got here that I think are, are almost more important than, um, you know, identifying these things. Because I mean, and we also know that a lot of these species have been lost uh, to the people due to colonialism and due to agricultural development. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it, and I'm certainly not, not the expert on every variety. And I think it's important to, for us to, uh, find ways to support those people that are actually trying to regain or trying to maintain that knowledge. So I'm much more familiar with Ontario systems when we look at Haudenosaunee and those circles of women, uh, those matriarchs that actually maintain, that have maintained a lot of their diversity in terms of the corn, squash, beans, and some of those other varieties that are there. Um, third question. Uh, the industrial agriculture has been so destructive for climate change and biodiversity. So why is the indigenous agriculture key to poverty reduction and sustainability? Yeah, and I, and I, I wouldn't characterize it like that. And I think that's, um, I was hoping to get my point across that, you know, these, these are two parallel systems that have evolved because, um, well, well, the industrial side, because there's a need to um, kind of find some economic development and that, that's just the path it went along. Um, and again, and I think we, I'm thinking I, I lecture in agroecology, so I think a lot of our approaches actually mirror some of that indigenous knowledge that has been utilized when we're thinking of soil fertility management, uh, when we're thinking of rain, uh, runoff management and things like that. A, a lot of these things 
are, are not unique ideas. We're, we're codifying them in new ways. We're able to really look at them precisely. But a lot of these practices have been done by all sorts of indigenous people uh, across the Americas and, or across the world, in fact. And, and I think really thinking about uh, agriculture beyond just a economic uh, capacity or an economic development project is key more so than looking at who's right in which particular thing, right? Of course, not every indigenous practice was benign. Um, over time, it evolved, it had to evolve to be benign um, as we adapted, as we saw, you know, right, the, the diminution or the, the decrease in fertility in particular areas, new techniques and new strategies needed to be evolved. And I think we have to keep that in mind as industrial agriculturalists or agricultural scientists to think about, we need to incorporate these multiple perspectives, right? If we think about what a farmer is right now, we have very uh, little touch, a lot of, um, not we in general, but a lot of people in cities and that are eating this food, they have very little touch or they're not in touch with farmers and what they go through. Um, and you know, there, there's these, these siloing in society where we should be celebrating and all being, uh, and we should all actually be able to inform policy and decision-making about agricultural policies for Canada. Right. Sorry, I was a little roundabout. No, no, that was great. Um, another question we had was how uh, Western resources view the agricultural view of agriculture can be united with indigenous knowledge. So how exactly should um, resources go about incorporating these themes into policy and um, future decision making? Yeah, well, and, and I think, you know, and again, I'm, all, I'm always wary of characterizing something as Western, right? I mean, we, we know there's a, a lot of white people and Western people that, that think of these things as, um, think of the importance of maintaining the sustainability of these systems. And they've been thinking about this from the get-go. And, you know, I think it's a byproduct to some extent of who's been in con control of our economic and political systems in the Western world, right? It's, it's been old white men for the most part. And, and that drive to um, develop the economy based on based, or the economy or the country or the agricultural sector in the vision of what they thought led to good life is really important. If we think about good life, it means a lot more uh, to other people, right? If we look at Indigenous peoples, we all have our own particular words for the good life and what that entails. And it's not just about economic uh, sustainability. It's about the health of the, those products. It's about the relationships that those create or, and maintain and enhance with the biodiversity that might be utilizing some of those products, right? I mean, a, a corn a corn stock is good for food, but it's also good for all that biodiversity, whether you're a pest or a beneficial insect there as well. So incorporating the benefits of these things to everybody, like I showed in those paintings, because, you know, my wellness is important to me, but we have to be a lot more empathic towards everything else out there, whether it's the soil microorganisms or those pests or, or beneficial insects out there. We have to think about how we are interacting with those and what our responsibility is to maintaining those, uh, despite something like pests not necessarily being something we want to maintain, but they are an integral part of every ecological network and being able to manage them in a proper way is, is really important. Yeah, absolutely. And a follow up to that question as well was um, where a resource may look at land as a resource, strictly a resource, whereas um, the Indigenous knowledge uh, component has more of a relationship and an honor and guard. Um, yeah, 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 for sure. One, and I think it's, it's the balance of, and I don't want to get too political, but who, who benefits from agriculture, right? We, we know farmers have had to invest a lot more to maintain a relatively similar lifestyle or, 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 or profitability, while there's all sorts of other industries associated with agriculture who's really been maximizing some of those profits. So thinking about that, even in kind of the Western neoliberal economic sense, we still see there's a huge gap between who's benefiting from agriculture. And if we start to incorporate different worldviews and different ways of being, we see that there's even a larger gap between what does agriculture actually benefit you know, a lot of our stuff is exported just by byproduct of what we can grow here. And there's nothing, uh, you know, naturally wrong with that, but we have to think about what does that mean for us and what do we have to do to mitigate that potential effect, that deleterious effect that that might bring about to the entire society of humans and the society of organisms and landscapes associated with agriculture. Yeah, so just that that needs to be more recognized when yeah. we decide to make decisions on how, yeah, exactly, exactly what you just said, how we use the resources that are grown. Yeah. Um, so 
what do you think of the argument that we can mitigate the loss of biodiversity by facilitating the transfer of non-native species preempting climate change to a degree? Yeah, you know, facilitative movement of diversity is a, a fascinating thing. And I, I think I'm not a non-native um, or I'm not a native plant spokesperson, especially, especially in the bee world. And I think, you know, things change, whether it's naturally through kind of just range expansion and, and climate change over thousands of years or through humans. I, I think it's just a byproduct of the type of organism we are uh, that, um, that, that we actually recognize the effects that we have. Um, again, there's all sorts of, depending on the species, right, there's probably all sorts of ecological considerations and whether those, those, those particular open niches actually exist in that environment. But again, I think this brings an opportunity for us to really think about who controls the land, who controls these ecological systems. And, and in fact, we shouldn't actually be in control of them. We should be working. We should all be spokespeople for the ecological integrity of these species networks. So we really have to think about this uh, much more diversely. Sure, I, I see people um, trying to revive the mammoth and utilizing uh, goats or uh, other ruminants to um, start to create more prairie-like habitat to maintain uh, tree-free corridors in some areas. Um, all, all these things are really important, but we, again, I think we have to consider things from, you know, those, all, all these things that don't have a voice, right, from the, the small species that, you know, nobody might care about except people that uh, are studying them to some of these more majestic species that are uh, usually get a lot of the conservation attention. So thinking about what it means to the ecological network, to the ecological functioning of the area um, should be prioritized. Yeah. Um, there was a question from Shirley. Uh, what is the role of wild, what, yeah, what is the role of wild rice? Um, beaver I hear was sacred in the area and by the original people. Um, were never hunted. When the new people moved in, were, there, were they only hunted? Have they been tech or built food landscapes? Yeah, yeah. So, so there's, yeah, and there, again, there's like such diversity with clan systems and, and, and the management of uh, resources based on clan systems. So depending where you go, right, you might have taboos against uh, hunting particular things, or you might have particular people, uh, like, a, you know, I'm from Crane Clan, right? We were uh, associated with the protection of wetlands and uh, kind of those coastal areas uh, along the lakes and things like that. And it's, the, it's the, those particular people within communities, there's these subgroups that, uh, you know, took the responsibility for managing a lot of these resources. And if we're thinking of something like wild rice, right, Manuman, it was pretty expansive, right? The, the knowledge was shared amongst uh, all sorts of groups. All sorts of groups had, you know, fairly similar uh, ceremonies associated with the collection and the harvest of wild rice. But thinking of a scientist, right, it's, it's a really neat ecological area. If you take a look at wild rice, right, you'll, you'll have baby ducklings growing in it. You'll have all sorts of tadpoles and using that for cover uh, from, from big, bigger predators, right? It served all sorts of functions. It served as a function of uh, waste nutrient, uh, uh, what am I thinking about? Uh, filtering, essentially, right? Through through being able to take a lot of those ex excess nutrients from the uh, terrestrial land and being able to utilize that themselves um, to maintain the, their own uh, productivity, while you know not seeing uh, not not resulting in a lot of those uh, problems we see with algae and nutrient overload in a lot of our lake systems right now. So so there's all these really beautiful ecological functions uh, that were uh, you know. That, that responsibility for the maintenance of those uh, functions and, and those species were given to particular people and communities, resulting in all sorts of uh, traditional teachings and indigenous knowledge uh, of who, who is responsible for those particular lanes. Um, in terms of beaver, I, I, know, I know my family caught a lot of beaver. They're, they're big trappers, so beaver was always something, you know, really um, important, both as a product for us to um, utilized for clothing, but also for a product to trade, right? Not, not everywhere had uh, beaver. Similar, not everywhere was able to grow corn. So there needed to be some sort of market and exchange amongst indigenous groups back then. What are some ways the industrial food system adapt? Um, yeah, the in ways the industrial food system can adapt some indigenous knowledges to achieve greater biodiversity and ecological resilience. No, that, that's, that's a great question. And, you know, I, I like to say, you know, I study bees, so don't, don't ask me these hard questions, but, but I think it's up to not only people like me to be talking about these things, but it's, you know, up to people within those industries to start pushing forward on that. 
we know if we do these social analyses of the uptake of new technologies or beneficial management practices, that there are these hubs, these really important individuals, whether it's a leader of a commodity group or leader of a local community, uh, whether it's particular politicians and uh, or policymakers, it's really um, making sure that making sure that they prioritize and, and they know that people in general, society in general wants to prioritize a lot of these other uh, indicators of success that I think is important. Um, as individuals, of course, I mean, we can uh, scream and shout all we want, but we know we do have to play into this uh, political process to some extent. And I don't just mean the political process at the federal or the provincial level, but, but think about what are those politics that happen in a, in a community for the adaptation of a beneficial management practice? Or how can we start to change at the grassroot level who actually is considered an agriculturalist, right? I think uh, we see all sorts of agricultural funding going to you know those typical agricultural commodities, but there's a lot of, uh, I, I think, opening it up to a wider perspective uh, of land management practices might actually benefit everybody. And again, I guess my idea is to stop being in these silos necessarily and think of the good of agriculture or, or the good of any, any process or, or the good of any sector is um, in opposition to the maintenance or the conservation of a particular project. If that is the case, there's something you know, tremendously wrong with our system if we have to look at the production of, of a product uh, and, and ignore those ecological um, consequences. If we're, if we're doing that, or whether we're doing it consciously or subconsciously, if we have to do that, there's something wrong with the entire system that needs to be fixed. Um, and I think these are big questions that the society in general have to tackle. So again, not, not, not good advice for somebody wanting to do something, but I think you know, so supporting local organizations, supporting local people, even being interested in talking about these topics, I think is uh, how we allow these ideas to evolve and actually start to uh, uh, bring about that change in our society. Scientists name what we know as their own discovery. For example, wild rice is not wild in our language because it was our food staple and more recently harvested for sale. Um, we do not call it wild in Anishinaabe Moen. Um, it is called rice. I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing this. Manuman? Um, Manuman? Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm so sorry. I think that was more of a comment than my question, but I think <laughs> it is important to discuss. Absolutely. Um, yeah, well, and I mean, and that's, you know, it's a, it's interesting. And I think to, to some extent it makes it, again, what were um, Europeans most, um, uh, what do they have know more, more about? They knew about rice, right? We knew about rice from Asia and things like that. So all this rice grows in a system we don't consider agricultural, so we'll call it wild rice, right? So, so again, it's that idea of perspective and how that influences names and how those names influence how we give importance or how we prioritize something like that in our society. Um, so I think kind of un understanding that the, the, even words matter and you know the continual use of these words ingrains a certain uh, ideology in our heads um, that you know it actually does not reflect that reality. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a way that we could begin to incorporate or even address some of these mis misused terms or like in a way to all and pro um, sorry, incorporate more Indigenous knowledge, but also um, just recognize a little bit more of the history rather than just accepting the names and terms that we use now. Yeah, yeah, and I, even at a basic level, I mean, of course, there's going to be people that are, you know, you know, gun, gung ho on this. Oh, yeah, let's get this done. But you know, you see, you see this pushback even within society when you put any Indigenous words next to a city name, right? You, you see that in British Columbia, where all the passes, all the mountains, all, all the areas have uh, Coast Salish names or uh, names from Squamish and all these things. And depending on where you are, that that will receive huge pushback. But I think e even those steps, I think we have to get beyond this and know that. You know, the entirety of Canada, for the most part, was already named, right? And these names represent things that are much more rich than just uh, the name of some old dude that was important, right? They, they, they represent those people. They represent what that ecosystem was. They re represent one big event that might have happened there. They represent the relationships or the interactions between different groups of people. Uh, understanding that language and, and how, you know, a lot of our knowledge that we might not have, you know, complete uh, perfect history and perfect tracking up is actually contained in, in those names. 
So, so something like, you know, appreciating the language and the cultures of those indigenous peoples that are there is really important. Um, and I kind of got off track where, where the question is, but, but again, it's bringing about these things. And again, it's just knowing more about the, the people that came before us, right? And even, you know, I take it for granted, even I was teaching a course um, in the winter and it's, oh my God, you know, I, to, to me, I, I've never taken indigenous studies or anything, uh, but all, all these things were so common to me and I'd, I'd be trying to figure out where my students' baseline level of their knowledge was. And unfortunately, it was really below where I even thought they would um, be coming into the university. So making sure that we're incorporating, and again, I don't know what the best way is to incorporate these into educational systems. We know that they need to be uh, indigenous knowledge, indigenous peoples need to be incorporated from that grade school level all the way to the university level. And, and again, it's a, a huge job to tackle. And I, I mean, I'm not sure how good education ministers are doing. And again, again, the education systems across Canada are doing better at it. Um, but it really requires the incorporation of indigenous people, not only there to give a single lecture, but to really think about how, uh, how we develop knowledge in our youth. Uh, going forward is important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you're exactly right. right. It has to be incorporated at an earlier stage than, you know, where it usually is incorporated now. It's And that's unfortunately the root of a lot of the... And again, we, and we see pushback, right? We, we, I think it was the province of Alberta, they had a uh, consultant saying, we can't teach kids about residential school because it's too sad, right? And so they're looking at changing the curriculum for... Yes, it's sad, but I mean, we learn about all sorts of other sad stuff that happened in Europe. We think about Egypt, right? Egypt, uh, you know, historical Egypt was built on the back of Jewish slaves and things like that. But, but we're happy to learn about those uh, cultures. So we have to think about what our culture and, you know, the highs and the lows of our culture. And I think it's important to understand that because that's formed uh, the ideology of a society. And to incorporate new ideologies, we have to understand what we might be missing in our own particular uh, worldview. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, how do we put a value on diversity in the homogenous, homog yeah, homogenous agricultural landscape of the current world? How would you go about that? Yes, yeah, so, I, so I, when I was doing my PhD at, at, at some point and somebody asked me, um, well, why is the diversity of bees important in this particular farm if it's only one bee species that does all the pollination? Well, who cares about all these other species? Right, and, and so, okay, because uh, uh, my argument was based on the ecological functioning or, or the ecosystem service of pollination. And they said, well, if you're only concerned about the, you know, the, the plant or the, the, the money value that a, a single bee gives you, of course, you're never going to be able to justify how important diversity is. But if you think that, you know, that those species have a right to this land, just as much as whoever owns that land has a right to that land. And I think we often don't consider that. We think of, uh, yeah, no matter how good, uh, how good humans are, right? We tend to think selfishly first, right? It's hard to be empathic towards animals. Not everybody has the opportunity to even be exposed and or be out on the environment or be out growing up on the land. So it's really hard to build that empathy with uh, species that are not ourselves. And I think we've done a really poor job as a global society of understanding that you know there's a lot of cultures it's not just the canadian indigenous or north american indigenous cultures that see not only animals as kin but also plants as kin also particular rock structures or rock formations or particular um you know physical things that are biophysical things abiotic uh, aspects out there as something that they're related to and something we're tied closely to and, and again i don't think this there's no easy solution um, to think about how we can start to prioritize our value biodiversity. Like a farmer is not going to benefit from increasing, or a, a farmer's you know, bottom line is not going to necessarily benefit from increasing biodiversity unless it's increasing an ecological function that results in better productivity for his crop. But I think going forward, I mean, especially you know, I have these aspirations of being prime minister, I, I think building in a mechanism to think about how we can actually monetize because I mean, I think humans are, we're, we're stuck using money for the future of our lives, I think, our future of, our, of our, our species. Figuring out a way to monetize or really provide some sort of benefit that everybody could understand um, that prioritizes or that puts value on the maintenance of conservation of 
landscapes, right? We know there's a lot of set aside programs and things like that, but I think it has to be incorporated into the actual um, agricultural pricing or the, the how, how we actually run our markets more so than just providing somebody with money to put a set aside and say, oh, this is my little beautiful piece near my farm that has biodiversity. But what about the rest of the farm? I, I think we, we can still start to work and think about how else we can uh, bring about uh, conservation practices that actually increase biodiversity and utilize these habitats as something more than just a means to produce an economic outcome. Great. Okay. Um, unfortunately, we're kind of running out of time here. So I guess we'll, this will be unfortunately the last question um, for today. If there are any additional questions, I'm so sorry we couldn't get to them. Um, but uh, what can be done to mitigate the negative impacts of modern science knowledge on the Indigenous peoples as regards to resource harvests, harvesting for use? Yeah, that's, a great, that's a great question. And I think you know, we're only at the very beginning of um, thinking about science for the benefit of everybody, right? I think at, at some point, you know, we thought, oh, science was elevating the uh, the the our, our, our society, right? Everybody would evolve and, you know, everybody would have more economic power. Everybody would have more, um, well, just, you know, ge generalizable well-being as our economy evolved. And a lot of our science, especially in agriculture, has focused on uh, that productivity aspect. Mm -hmm. And you, you, even within our own faculty, of course, we have these stakeholders that are the most involved, our commodity groups and our, our people that are um, you know pr producing a, a, a crop of a, a product, mm -hmm. and of course, and I have, of course, and I think these things also need to continue, right? That, that that's a that's a branch of science that is really important. Um, again, yeah, it's, it's a really tricky question. How, how how do we mitigate it? Again, I think something that we tend to talk about often, but we don't do properly, is this knowledge translation. And we have to we have to start thinking about how we can elevate um, indigenous communities uh, through what everything that's been developed, right? So there's a lot of actual reconciliation work that needs to be done because there has been all sorts of historical research done on indigenous traditional lands uh, that never got to those indigenous people. There's a lot of research that gets done on their land that, that actually doesn't benefit and it might actually make things worse uh, as you know resource companies might might use it for whatever means they need to. So, so we really have to think about what we're doing as scientists and is it benefiting society in general? Of course, you know, that might eliminate some of our fundamental biology when we're looking at such uh, the minutia in our field, but, you know, making sure that we're contextual, contextualizing ourselves in the greater society is important. Um, right now, I might, I might catch bees in somewhere remote where there's no people uh, and something like that, but, you know, how does that play into what I'm doing as a scientist is important to think about. Um, you know, does that it might push our knowledge of, you know, uh, entomology further, but what does it actually, how does it inform uh, the maintenance of a particular ecosystem? Can all these lessons be brought to um, communities? And again, I, I don't have a good answer because I think, you know, it's a, such a huge problem that's going to involve a lot of community consultation. It's going to involve a lot of creativity by researchers themselves who are the experts in these fields. Uh, of course, you know, I have my own I, I ideas of how these things uh, should go, but you know, all sorts of people, indigenous or not, are going to have other ideas that might be even better than uh, my perspective. So, so I think really it is that consultation of uh, what we do as scientists, right? And we don't necessarily think, oh, you know, I do so and so particular type of science. It doesn't affect it doesn't affect indigenous peoples, so I don't really need to consult with indigenous people. But I think anything that gets done in Canada, I think we have a duty and a responsibility to make sure that. You know, they're, they're, that's kept in minds of people, I think. At, at least that's what I think. No, and you're absolutely right. And I think it's unfortunately something that has gone, gone undervalued and underrecognized in terms of research design, policy design, and every sect of yeah. research, especially with agriculture and work as well. All right, well, I would like to thank you again, Kyle. Uh, your presentation was great. It was very informative and we all really appreciate you spending your time this afternoon talking to us about your research and your work. Um, I would also like to thank the audience for attending the webinar. And I would also like to thank the Mino B. Madiswin. I'm 
so sorry if I'm mispronouncing anything. I'm very sorry, but um, we do really appreciate this partnership and it was great to get to work with you all at the University of Manitoba um, and get to talk on, on this topic today. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great afternoon.